As I mentioned, I am Kate Okiyama with Marketing and Communications at Strive. So welcome to the Strive webinar. During the webinar today, our sports scientists are gonna go through and take us through how Strive can be integrated into your training and how it's gonna be beneficial to your organization. So joining us today, we have Strive sports scientist, Zach Shelley, applied sports scientist, Dean Riddle, and the director of Olympic sports strength conditioning at Utah State, Logan Ogden. Welcome guys. Now, as we get ready to hand it over to the guys, I do wanna to touch base on what some of the things we're gonna be covering today. So today we want to discuss the bio, biometrics measurements in sports, take you through our next level sports science system, and then show you how Strive can be applied to your, excuse me, can work in your applied setting. And then of course, at the end, let's go ahead and open up to questions for anyone that you have. Um, you can also use the chat throughout the webinar as well. We'll be kind of monitoring that too, but we do want to save the questions to the end. Um, so for now, I'll go ahead and hand it over to my teammates, Dean and Zach, to take it away. All right. All right, Dean, you want to start by uh, introducing yourself and then oh. I, I go and then we can let Logan give a little background. No worries, Al academic, uh, uh, alphabetic order, I presume. So Dean, go <laughs> first. So uh, nice to see everyone. It's obviously a strange world, the uh, COVID-19 world. And so um, thanks everyone for making the time, as Kate said. Um, the uh, background varied uh, from working in uh, multiple sports in different parts of the world, uh, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and here in the United States. Um, I've uh, primarily got a strength and conditioning background and evolved into sports science over the years. And uh, one of my last positions was at the Seattle Seahawks where I was the applied sports scientist. Awesome. And uh, I'm, I'm working as the main sports scientist for Strive currently. And was working with the Mississippi State football team and other sports doing a lot of data, data work um, with all their performance data before that. And um, Logan's kind enough to join us. His team is currently gearing up for an NCAA tourney run. Um, he's kind enough to join us from his hotel room. So Logan, you and I, he's been with us for two years using Strive data and um, really makes good use of the, um, the tech that we're offering. So. Logan, you want to give us a little background on yourself? Yeah, my name is uh, Logan Ogden. Uh, again, Director of Olympic Sports at Utah State University. Uh, I'm live from Indy uh, in my isolated hotel room in the bubble. So um, we are, uh, I, I'm the Director of Olympic Sports, but oversee men's basketball and volleyball at Utah State. Um, and then previously, I was at University of Nebraska Omaha as a director there for Olympic sports. And then um, I was an assistant at Augustana University in Sioux Falls prior to that uh, education. I went to Northwestern College in um, Iowa. I got my undergraduate degree in kinesiology and sports management. And then I got my master's degree at South Dakota State uh, in exercise physiology. Yeah, awesome. And we're glad to have, uh, have Logan here. So Let's dive in. I think um, the first topic that we'll cover, just to ease everybody in, is something that um, has been around for a while that I'm sure a lot of people are, um, have been introduced to already and are familiar with, but we'll talk about external load. Uh, Strive Tech is actually, they have an accelerometer in the puck that's, that's giving external load numbers. Um, and Logan, you want to start off by just talking about how you look at those numbers and then we can transition into um, how how the muscle load, muscle load and EMG technology can enhance those numbers. Yeah, to kind of give you a basic overview of kind of a year and how we use it. Um, in the summer, in the summer, I, util, I utilize the external load to track, you know, my periodization in the weight room and and on the field as we run or in the court as we run uh, and do all of our all of our movement prep and conditioning. Um, really trying to use data from the in season prior. Uh, this being our second season, this was our really our first off season of of, of usage uh, for that. But looking at data from our in season, knowing you know, roughly what external loads look like in games in, um, in particular weeks in the preseason and then obviously late off season or late in season, excuse me, as we're prepping for conference tournament, national tournament, that sort of thing. Um, I can get a, a good gauge of what a what appropriate load needs to be. And then from a periodization standpoint, where I, what goals I need to reach for each individual group of, of athletes, you know, if um, external load for 
you know, average external load for preseason is, is X. I need to be above that um, in, in my periodization to lead into that, to make sure that we're, we're prepared one um, and two, we're, we're staying injury free as we get ready to go. So. Yeah, absolutely. Kate, do you have those um, graphs? Can we, are they sharing right now? Yes. Awesome. We have that um, really good one here that shows uh logan's external and load and muscle load plotted seven to seven day rolling average um so logan if you want to talk us through kind of um your planned periodization and then how this has helped you actualize that yeah and so this is this is from 2019 um so the start of that graph is is our preseason uh, with practice, practice and training uh, leading into our first game. So, I mean, that's we're doing our our very best to kind of auto regulate our guys and and um, and team practice to make sure that we're performing at our best, but also not trying to detrain as well. So, um, there's this fine line between you know, making sure we're fresh all the time and then detraining. We got to make sure we don't cross that threshold. Uh, kind of as you see there in December, uh, we're kind of ramping up and then we have a little vacation period there um, in, in leading into January. Um, and then we kind of spike it back up. And then the, that last that last little bit, that downward drop from February to March, uh, we're really trying to peak and taper our guys to get ready for the conference tournament. We we won the conference tournament uh, in 2019, got the auto bid to the national tournament before COVID. So I feel like one of the one of the really good things that our our staff does, our coaching staff is is our head coach and all of our assistants really have a good grasp of periodization. So when when I bring stuff to them, I bring data to them, I bring ideas to them. Um, they're really on board with however it needs to work and they understand what we need to do. So we, uh, we pride ourselves on being, uh, you know, at our best at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And then we see, oh, okay. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I guess, I guess so. Uh, uh, we see this, this is Chris break, break um, um, in the middle of the year, year a dip, a dip and, and then um, back, back, back up. Can you talk Can you about, talk the, about challenges? the challenges? Um, um, Turning from a break like that, that and, and how are you, how are you monitoring? monitoring? Obviously, Obviously you ramped ramp the load up, up. Yep. but, but how, how are you monitoring their response, response from an internal perspective? Right, so in, in this particular instance, we, uh, we ramped a little too high um, coming off that break. So it, we needed to have a little bit more gradual, a little bit more of a gradual increase in uh, in load uh, coming after that Christmas break. We actually started, um, you know, January the first of the year with two really bad losses right there, and and I'm, it's not all 100 percent attribute to like overtraining and not, and in high loads. It's, there's a lot of factors, but once we got into that time frame. Like that was definitely a red flag for us, and as you saw on that graph, we we dropped sharply right after that because um, we we just we auto corrected ourselves and we're like, okay, we got to back off a little bit here, and then we and then we took a better approach then into the end of January, February, and went on a really good run, um, strung a lot of wins together, and set us up well for the conference tournament. That's great. That's great. All right. All right. Let's talk about the muscle muscle load. How are you utilizing? The EMG sends the shorts, the shorts um, um, and we have kind of two avenues, avenues that we've talked about, about just activation, activation as, a as a whole. Right. And then and, and the, the specific, specific muscle groups. How are you yeah. using um, the asymmetries and the ratio portions versus the overall amplitude? I think I, I probably put a little bit more value into the muscle load or the internal load than I, eat, than I do the external load. Um, I obviously look at both, but I kind of know, depending on the time of year, what the ratios of those two things should be. If we're in the off season, you know, they should be pretty close to equal or even internal load, maybe a little higher just because I'm, we're, we're maybe a little bit more out of shape. We're trying to get into shape. Um, and I'm not, I don't have any competitions coming up. We don't have to compete at a high level. Uh, we're just training. So that's kind of that time frame. Uh, once we get into the in season, you know, I want to see our, our internal load um, lower than our external load, um, or our muscle load lower than our, our, our external load. Um, as I'm looking at individual guys or even team, and I see 
and I see the muscle load creep above our external load or see it equal, I try to, I start asking questions. Um, you know, you know, are, are we coming off, you know, did we just come off of a game? We practicing the day after a game, you know, did we have, you know, four games in six days or, you know, what's, what are the reasons behind that? Or is it because of, you know, practices are too difficult or our recovery habits not uh, pro appropriate so between that and then we use i use a, utilize the surveys the rpe surveys and the wellness surveys as well to kind of get a a, a a more clear picture for each individual guy you know maybe we're not sleeping maybe we have a high academic load maybe you know our nutrition or hydration isn't on point uh with a lot of that so so i can kind of i can kind of make assessments assessments that way um with uh with the with the muscle load um yeah i think that's with, and then from like right to left symmetry, uh, glute hamstring quad ratios, then I, I do that a little bit more of an individual basis. So I'll look at like three, seven or 14 day averages um, on, on both of those symmetry and, and um, muscle groups. So if I see a right to left issue um, with symmetry uh, in a direction, over that, over those time frames, or it's been consistent, I start to ask questions again, um, whether it's a, an injury or you know an overuse thing, or you know it could be it could be a number of things. Um, otherwise, um, with the, and then with the um, hamstring quad glute, like just the proportion of of usage right to left and the total. With that, I mean, obviously trying to mitigate any soft tissue injuries and stuff like that. So um, you know, with a few of our guys in the past, I've seen issues with both of those where, you know, they're high quad or high hamstring or high glute. And then I start to ask questions and decide, you know, discern whether or not it's, you know, tightness or overuse or what that might be. And then I use my expertise as long, along with our athletic trainers. And then we try to mitigate that. And I, we usually can be ahead of those types of things. We haven't really had a soft tissue injury uh, in the last two years that I can, that I can recall uh, the right to left symmetry has, has proven to be very valuable um, in um, finding injuries. We found uh, like a turf toe. We found um, a kind of the start of a, a stress reaction, stress fracture um, ahead of time where, you know, instead of we're not just waiting for it to happen, we, 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 have, some, we have some information and we can start asking questions and solve some problems ahead of time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, that's the important part that I think we're trying to offer is, we want to be the jumping off point for investigation and saying here's the outlier whether it's favoring activation of a right leg or left leg or glute versus hamstring and then be that the jumping off point to say okay here's where you start your further investigation um okay we actually have that stress fracture example um in a slide and logan if you could talk us through the uh recognition of recognition of it yeah yeah right there. Um, and then the diagnosis and then kind of how your intervention afterwards. Right. So with, so with this one, um, here, the, I started noticing, uh, discrepancy between right, left symmetry, um, early and was asking questions and trying to figure out now, this particular athlete, um, is a very, very tough kid. You know, he was dealing with some pain, but it wasn't holding him out of play by any means. Um, so we did a little bit of investigation and it was kind of, it was kind of, I don't know, more or less diagnosed as, as a, as a nerve issue, not necessarily anything else, but it continued to get worse. Um, and there at that last, so that was kind of the beginning and you can see that the yellow incline there um, with, uh, with the left leg, we started noticing it early and then um, it, we got to the point where it was significant and like his play had not stopped he was still playing but his his uh, performance was decreasing so at that point in time we did further investigation and found out that he had a stress fracture so uh that was the diagnosis line as soon as that as soon as we did that he was pulled from play and we started rehabbing instantly um and so he was wearing a boot um and we were seeing some you know he's wearing a boot 24 7 so we were seeing some significant atrophy in the quad and calf uh, of that leg so we were doing a lot of blood flow restriction work uh, a lot of isometric contraction um and isometric holds and then and some and some significant right leg training um uh, when we were when we were trying to bring them back and i was watching internal load or muscle load um specifically with this athlete to make sure that i was we were training that leg higher and, and getting it, getting it back to where it needed to be. And then 
um, as, as you see that blue line start to downward go down, uh, he was returning to play right there. So, you know, we were, and we got, he's back. He was, um, he was out for three weeks and came back and he has had, hasn't had an issue since. Um, so we've, we're very fortunate with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic example of just to give a little context behind this graph. Um, that was a single, each, each line was a single, single day. And so tracking that over time, seeing the trends over time, seeing, See it gets get worse, knowing that's the time to investigate, um, just like Rogan did. Uh, I, I find that as one of one of the one of the many great success stories um, using Strive to identify um, identify when a player is hurting, even though a player might not not want to admit it at times. Yeah. So that was really yeah. cool. And none of these kids want to miss want to miss anything. They don't want to miss practice. They don't want to miss games. Um, and so it takes a it, with this particular scenario like we were investigating and we were getting information that you know we were he was in pain but he wasn't letting on how much pain he was actually in I think if if um if we could got to where he was a little bit more transparent we might might have avoided it altogether but needless to say that didn't happen um but we were able to react quickly it wasn't a you know we weren't sitting around and and letting it get full-blown so Hey, Logan, a question. How, how much do you allow the athletes to see their data? What does that look like for you when you're talking to them and you can see change? What does yeah. that look like in the real applied setting? Because, you know, they all want to play like you've just said. What mm -hmm. does that look like, that conversation? And maybe talk to an example where it's gone, you know, well and or poorly, you know? I let them, I'll let the athlete look at their data anytime they want. Um, I've got more, I've got kids, some kids that are very, very intuitive and want to know uh, exactly what's going on. They think it's cool too. Uh, so th that's very interesting, but usually um, I don't bring anything to them unless I start to see until it's at the point where I start to see significant change that, that I, and I want to investigate further. Um, but I will, even even early off season preseason, um, I'll don't, I'll know, notice like very very small nuances, things that aren't like aren't glaring as far as like there you're going to get injured or it's a soft you know we're looking at soft tissue injuries or anything. I I just say okay you know we got a little bit of a discrepancy here. I want you to do this this and this and then I'll, I'll uh, and we actually use a um, we use a software program called Fit F Y T T. And so it's a, it's a programming system that um, for strength coaches and I'm able to like actually just send everything right to their phone. So I'll individualize uh, whatever program I need to do with, um, you know, utilizing FRC or um, RPR or just, or just basic, you know, mobility or soft from a soft tissue standpoint, or even structural uh, work with the, with the athlete, I'll send it right to the folks. Like, hey, you got this three days a week. And if, if I'm starting to see it trend back to the way it needs to be perfect, there's no further investigation. We don't need to go any further. That's what it was. Uh, maybe it was an activation. Maybe it was a, you know, a hip mobility or ankle joint uh, structural structural issue that we needed to address. Um, and then obviously working with them on an individual basis in the weight room as well. So, yeah, they, I, like I said, I let them see whatever they want to see whenever they want to see it. Um, but some guys don't. They, they, have, they have no intention of, of – looking at themselves on there at all. Um, but those guys too, I, if, if I see something, then I bring it up to them. So. Cool. You want to speak to, I think uh, well, an interesting bit of that is tracking, tracking progress is like being able to quantify, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is, are my interventions working? Do you want to speak a little bit to how did you handle that um, before having strive and then how has strive change that being able to track it's like okay i'm i'm giving you an intervention to change uh for, for rehab purposes for performance purposes and then how do you assess the success rate of that intervention right i feel like in the past i was using the shotgun method you know i was just spraying bbs everywhere and hopefully i, I hit the right spot so um where where i am now is just i have i have you know tangible information that gives me very specific um, knowledge of what's going on with our athletes. So um, I utilize it um, in that manner. And then I feel like our, our return or our, our, our 
I don't know how you say it, like um, our changes are, are much, much faster. So like I was dealing with, um, I started noticing uh, last year with a couple of athletes, you know, um, glute, ha- glute hamstring ratio um, discrepancy. So um, I started going to them right away and say, hey, we, let's work on this, this and this. And they're like, you know, coach, my hamstring has been really tight. You know, but he's not going to not saying anything. He what he's playing and he's going through. He's getting through it. You know, um, so we will start working with him right away. And you know, within a few days, a week, um, it's it's good. And you know, he's he's feeling a lot better. Even with one that was having some issues with glute activation, just purely glute activation. So we were doing a lot of ice. So I started doing isometric holds with him, and we started doing some RPR for for glute activation, and 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 then it was it was the ratio flipped, you know, to where it was, to where it was equal across the board. He's just like, I don't feel as tired now. Like as when I'm, you know, I don't get as worn out, like when I'm practicing and running, you know, cause he was purely quad dominant, not using any of that, not necessarily not using it, but it, it was, it was very, very quad dominant. And, and that, uh, that area wasn't being utilized as much. And he's like, yeah, I'm just not as tired anymore, you know? And so, um, like there was never, ever an, an issue, never missed any time, never had a soft tissue strain or anything like that. But we made, but I can pick out subtle, subtle changes we need to make, make them. And we can see changes within the day, uh, within the week. So. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. I think that's uh, the glute hamstring um, ratio is something that I've been reading a lot um, about recently and that I've seen, with our, between our different coaches starting to utilize a little bit more is how um, obviously their athletes will use their posterior chain, but then in which, how are they activating glute versus hamstring is, um, is pretty interesting to look at and will continue to grow as the body of users grow as well. Um, so, oh, so good. Have you, have you got to a point with individual athletes across the squad, you can see their normals? Are you at the point where you've got enough data now to understand what a normal ratio looks like for different athletes? They're all human beings, very different. Their positional requirements are different. Are you seeing right. trends there for positional groups within your, within your basketball sport? Yeah, and, and Zach, Zach does a great job with with data and helping me out and, and putting a lot of that together for me and showing me like, hey, this is kind of some normative stuff for this position group or this individual athlete. Um, but yes, and and like you said, basketball is not the same as you know football. You know, it, it's a it's a highly uh, we, we we depend highly on deceleration. We're playing in a we got five seven foot guys on the team and we're playing in a. 10 by 10 box, you know, so it's not like, it's not like they're reaching top speed at 20 miles an hour, you know, after everything, it's highly, we're doing a lot of acceleration, a lot of deceleration, a lot of planting, changing direction. So the sport itself is different than if we were looking at, at data, normative data from another sport. So, um, so yeah, so looking at our positions, I break them up into position. We get centers, forwards and guards. Um, we actually made, um, kind of a, I don't know if that was you and I, Zach, that were talking about how the, the, the internal loads for our guards are a little bit higher usually than our centers and posts. I mean, our centers and posts are going from rim to rim, but at the same time, they're not sprinting off of, off of cuts and making back cuts and handling the ball and trying to defend off screens. You know, they're, they're in the post, they're going block to block and then they go to the other side, you know, so their, their overall um, uh, muscle load is, is usually, usually a little bit lower than, than their guards. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And then, um, so you talked a little bit about um, players trying to play through things. And Kate, if you want to pull up that last slide, um, you had an interesting case that you talked about. You briefly mentioned at the very beginning of turf toe. If you want to walk us through um, this here at the beginning of the season and how you were able to utilize strives asymmetry to um, kind of monitor and make sure that it was not getting worse while he was still playing full minutes. Right. And like with, uh, and everybody knows turf toe can just be a, a pain. Um, it's nagging and it's lasts a long time. Um, but there early in November, um, as you can see with the, the, the left leg uh, increase there in the yellow, um, he, he was uh, developing a developing turf toe. And I noticed, I noticed over, I believe that was a seven day trend um, he, he started just his symmetry just uh, started to 
you know, shift one way further and further and further and further. So I asked him, so I just brought him aside after practice and I said, Hey, what's going on? And he's just like, my toes has been bugging me. And I said, let's go to the training room and, and see. And like, he hadn't missed practice. Uh, we, I think we maybe played one game or two games at that point in time. And, um, or we're getting ready or we'll play like a scrimmage possibly. And the trainer's like, yeah, he's got turf toe. It's like, it's really, um, it's not severe, but he has it. And so with, so we just kind of, treated it and you know, he did everything we needed to do to make sure that we could uh, get him through and have as little pain as possible. And you can see that dip there, like right at the end of uh, December, or January, well, that was time off. Um, so they obviously got better with some time off, but we're, you know, we're trying to practice every day and play two or three games a week all the way through there. And so we were honestly, we we're just trying to make sure that he stayed uh, as pain-free as possible you know, he started to trend back towards more, more even there towards the, towards the end of the year. But, but yeah, like that, that big spike, that's where we kind of started to notice it. Um, and then we kind of got on top of it. Now, like I said, he never missed any practice, never missed a game. Uh, we had a couple of convenient breaks with bye week and Christmas break and kind of got a little time off and, and kept him going. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's one of the unique, uh, unique uses of um, again, it's it's not unique in that you've used it multiple times, but unique to this technology specifically, being uh, being able to track in game in practice. In that we know um, we're not going to be able to sit a player out. We don't want a player to miss times, but being able to say, okay, can I throw in little interventions and make sure that it it's getting better and not getting worse. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Good. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to speak a little bit to, I want you to speak a little bit to um, communicating data to your head coach or whoever the stakeholder is. Um, how do you do that from just a, any pure data standpoint? Um, and just try to make that easier. Does this muscle data come into communication at all? Um, what is his relationship with, uh, with this, this tech? Yeah, I think, um, I'm in a very unique situation, um, as I, as I kind of talk to my colleagues where our, um, our coaching staff is very, very open and, uh, understanding of, of what I'm looking at, what the data is providing us and then how to, uh, adjust and change, uh, whether that be, just our daily periodization, weekly periodization, however that might be. Um, so, when I present when I present data to to Coach Smith, it is a he just wants to know he wants to know the answer. He doesn't he doesn't want a bunch of numbers and charts and all that kind of stuff. He just wants the answer. So so I just so I assess it and I tell him what I think. And, and he usually he's very very intuitive. So he he's just like you know I've noticed something else along the same lines from his coach's eye uh, along the same lines. And he's just like, I agree with you. Let's, let's do this. You know, uh, he's always asking, constantly asking me like, how are the guys, how are the guys, you know, we'd be in the middle of practice and how the guys look, how do the guys look? Um, and I just tell him like, we look good. We look bad. We look, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at these three guys, maybe give them a little bit fewer reps and he automatically does it. Um, and so he's, He's very, very open to to the information I provide him. Like I said, he doesn't. I I started out sending him the reports every single time, and he called, he's just like, quit sending me those. I don't know. I don't know. And he's just like, you just need to tell me what 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 it is. And so and so we, that's how we kind of uh, communicate. And like I said, I, I think it's a. I'm I'm blessed. It's a unique uh, a unique working environment with, as far as that goes. And he's very very open to everything. Yeah, and you. So you say one of the questions is, and I think I think that's um, that is a really unique unique environment. But you said one of the questions is, how are the guys? Um, what what normally goes into? We touched a little bit on muscle load and how that um, works as a response tool. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't we haven't said the the buzzword of efficiency yet. Can you yeah. speak a little bit to what goes into that answer of how are the guys? How do you evaluate that? Yeah, so um, usually I watch uh, I watch practice live uh, uh, with Strive. So we got it set up, and and I'm seeing data roll in on the iPad live. So um, when I'm looking at at that, I'm looking at the the difference between um, external load and internal load, or external load and muscle load. 
which gives me the, that efficiency number. Um, and so I kind of have an idea more or less back to what um, kind of Dean was uh, alluding to earlier of what a normal, like what a practice looks like and how hard this practice should be. Um, Cause I get a, I get a practice plan every single day I go through and I know, you know, that, you know, dribbling is not going to be that high, but our five on five uh, rebounding drill where we're knocking guys into the floor, like that's going to be high. So um, I can kind of assess like this practice is, is low, medium or high, just on a you know, very general periodization thought process. And then I can assess where, where a player is. Now, if I see a player that's, his uh, muscle load is probably too high for this particular practice, then that raises the red flag. So if coach asked me something about that, I, you know, I'll say, Hey, you know, this guy, let's, let's give him a few less reps. He's, he's looking a little fatigued today. And then I always follow that assessment up with talking to the player after. So um, like, Hey, how'd you sleep? How, how's your hydration? How's your nutrition? You know, you got you have a bunch of tests this week, you know, just to make sure that, you know, it was if it's something simple to fix like that, you know, the, and that's happened several times. And, you know, I was like, I was like, hey, well, how's your nutrition today? I haven't eaten today. OK, so, you know, or or, you know, how's your hydration? Oh, I, I, it hasn't been great. I need to be better. OK, you know, and, and we might see it. We might say that see that flip in a day um, just from from that standpoint. I also look at the total like total team. Um, overall and we'll have we'll have certain outliers like um, from a from a weight room standpoint so we do uh, we do some uh, micro dosing in season so we'll train four or five times a week you know and still play our normal two games three games whatever that might be um, so with that with that I have three or four different programs running at the same time, depending on how many minutes are played, uh, the importance of the guy to the team, you know, what year they are in school, that sort of thing, their training age. And so, you know, if I see a, a redshirt freshman and his, in, I mean, his muscle load is super high in this particular practice, it's supposed to be low, it's okay, because I know what I did to him earlier in the day when we lifted. So, I mean, I, there's some there's some context that go in, into it. So I can't just only look at the team load. I have to kind of break it down individually and make sure I give coach uh, coach a good view of, of what each guy is feeling and doing. Hey, Logan, um, when you've got the coach and the team's practicing and the coach, everyone's looking good in practice, and, and, you know, he says, oh, man, everyone's looking good. And you have the conversation around, yeah, they looked good. But actually what we know, because we're measuring, you know, accurately the, the internal load and specifically muscle load, how does that conversation go for you when you've had success cases or, or even when you've not been successful and then you've learned a lesson from that so you can, you can use the, you know, the muscle load as, a, as an accurate measure to you know, solve that problem? So, like, so um, correct me if I'm wrong. So when I see... So like if I see appropriate loads and practices also good, those two things correlate. How is that conversation with myself and coach? It's when um, it's when the coach you see a coach um, seeing the players and they go, um, uh, the, they the players look good, but you know that their muscle load has been etc. Sure. The conversations and it's around their nutrition or it's around um, you know their sleep and you've gone and talked to the player. What does that look like for you to solve that, you know, for the coach and how do those conversations go? You know, maybe a good example of that. Um, th they go well, they go really well. Um, I don't think uh, coach Smith trusts kind of my expertise and what, what we're trying to accomplish um, as well as it, you know, if, if I see something, if I see, if like overall practice is good, but there might be one guy that's, that's bad. And maybe that guy is of a high importance. Um, and I problem solve that on the side with, with what, it, what that might be any other type of variable. Um, you know, I might've told coach in practice, like, Hey, this guy is, this guy's having an issue today. Um, then if I get that solved, like I usually don't even bring it back up to him. It's, uh, it, you know, it, the, the next day the guy looks great or that, you know, he starts to trend in the correct direction over the next week or so. It's, it's um, usually when I have those conversations with him, um, it's, and we see like a persistent, a persistent downward change. Then we, then we really start to have uh, a little bit more in depth conversation together, but you know, he's focused on, 
he's focused on practice and preparing for the next team and, and making sure that the, um, you know, we're prepared to perform at our best. And it's my job to make sure that the guys on an individual basis are, are prepared um, for, for that competition and those practices. So he really trusts me and all that. So. Logan, you mentioned briefly um, using it, using in the weight room. Yeah. All right. And um, I know that's something that, that you do. And I think it's, it's really cool because it's, it's very unique, right? In that whenever you're using um, a lot of other load, like external load monitoring devices, uh, if you put them in the weight room, they're not gonna pick up anything, right? They're walking around, they might be sitting at a, at a rack, maybe one or two racks, they're rotating between, but it's not gonna pick up very much. Can you talk about how you're using uh, muscle load specifically in the, in the weight room? Right, yeah, so like to kind of build on that a little bit more, if you, if you took a game, one of our games, kind of an average external load for a game is anywhere between 500 and 700. Um, an average external load for a lifting session where we're not doing any running is probably anywhere from 25 to 75. So that those numbers don't mean anything in the weight room, uh, as you were saying. But from a from a muscle load standpoint, I get a ton of information. Um, I can see obviously. Uh, right to left symmetry if we're doing a, a squat or any type of bilateral movement. Also, I'm looking at glute quad hamstring ratio. Um, you know, you know, if, if I'm focused, if I am specifically focused on, um, you know, posterior chain development in a specific day, like then I want to see where, what we're doing, where we're doing it, uh, what the dominance is there. Um, also too, just, from an overall, an overall periodization, like I know that an average muscle load for a game um, is anywhere between 300 and 400, right? Well, so my training sessions need to be equivalent to that to make sure I'm preparing the athlete to uh, be able to take on that stress from practice, from games in, in, in that scenario. And that's, and that's the, that's my area to make sure that we're preparing the tissue to take on all that type of load. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Okay, do you have any examples? Are you watching this um, live in the weight room at all, or is it mostly okay? I go back and look at it afterwards and say, "Hey, I wanted to hit these muscle groups for these guys. Did I hit these muscle groups, and how hard did I hit them?" Yeah, it's all it's all after in the weight room. Um, it's just me in there on the floor. I've got and I've got a GA that helps with me as well. But I'm I, if you saw a training group, I'm running around like crazy. So it's yeah. not uh, I don't have, <laughs> at, at practice. I'm just I'm more or less just sitting there kind of uh, and uh, and watching everything live. But in the weight room, I'm coaching really hard and the guys are working really hard. I've got all their work to rest ratios are on me. So um, I go back and look at it after. Um, and, and then like, I kind of, I, I plotted out, um, over the, over the off season. Like I said, this was our, my first off season with it. Cause the, the previous year we didn't start using it until preseason, uh, basketball practice already started. So, and then, and then this off season was wild because we had, you know, you had a two week quarantine and then two guys got COVID. So then you had another two week quarantine and then you had these five guys out and then they came back. And so it was just all over the place. But at the same time, I kind of knew obviously from last year's data, what these are my baselines. These are roughly my baselines of where I need to be. So I need to make sure that I'm, I'm touching those um, at least before we get to practice um, before we get to 20 hour weeks and practicing a lot. So that's, that's more or less what I was using them for. And then um, obviously if I knew, if I knew like, Hey, we're lifting at this intensity, this much volume, it should probably our internal load or muscle load should be roughly this high. If it's not, if it's not that I'm under training them, uh, we're not, we're not reaching the potential that we need to reach. If it's way too high, well, then I'm going to overreach them probably too far. And we're not going to be able to be, we're not going to be prepared for the weeks to come. If I don't, if I don't periodize this correctly. Uh, so that kind of gives me a, a little snapshot of, of where I am in my periodization and where we need to be for, uh, to be prepared for practicing games. Yeah, that's oh, good. Dude. Yeah, question. Um, the player experience when they're wearing them, um, you know, where have been the success things in terms of uh, players wearing the compression shorts? Um, yeah, and you know, where maybe are the things that you would do, you know, the, the lessons you've learned going, okay, don't do this. What does that look like in terms of the player experience? Uh, they, they don't even know they have it on. 
honestly. Um, the the shorts are the the compression shorts they wear anyway, no matter what, uh, whether we're lifting, practice, run, game, doesn't matter. Um, so they wear them no matter what. The puck is right there in front of them, and it's it's fastened tightly and plugged into the shorts, and it flips over and. They they honestly don't have it on. The only th- only time they really notice it is that they hit the puck with the bar and we're snatching or something. Um, but that's I broke a couple pucks that way. Sorry, but uh, that's the really the only that's really the only uh, time they've noticed it. The the they we have I, I mean they're still eighteen year old kids, so um, you know they they kick their shoes off without untying them and they they do those types of things. So sometimes they'll just rip the the sensor off the put off the shorts with the puck. But uh, I, I, that's far less than I, than I think it, it probably could be. Um, so you got to kind of remind them of that every once in a while. But otherwise, the wearing experience is phenomenal. Yeah, that's that's what I, that's what I was definitely going to um, talk to next. And um, so we've outfitted um, a bunch of your team's colors, the specific um, types. How is that? How do you think that has helped? Um, and I know operationalizing is a huge, I think this is what Dina's getting out of love with his question, but opera, 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 oh gosh, operationalizing is a um, big deal. What does a workflow look for, like for you in getting the shorts set up, um, downloading the data afterwards? Can you talk, yeah. walk us through that? Yeah, so all the, um, from a, all the shorts, all the guys have three pairs of shorts. And so, uh, when we come to kind of how our day is organized is we lift before practice every, pretty much every day. So um, I have a pair of shorts for them. When they get to the weight room, they get to the weight room, they put them on, they put the puck on, and we start training. And we go right from the weight room to practice. So from from there, we practice, same shorts, everything. Um, my first year, my first year, I had an, I, we lifted, actually, it was kind of all over the place. We lift, depending on class schedules, we lift earlier in the day and then have a block break before practice or we would lift after practice. So in that time frame that we had in between practice, um, the sensors wouldn't be wet from sweat and stuff. So I was kind of getting some wonky data um, early on the first year, um, but then I just started I just started collecting data after they had started getting sweaty. So that was um, that was a change that we had made. But the way we're, we way we've done it this year is they're already sweaty from practice or from lift, and they go right to practice. So data collection um, that way is is pretty seamless. And then I run um, I run my my live sensors at practice it downloads all the data right away right there uh when they're done i get the puck from them from practice they go to the locker room they put their shorts on a on a loop a uh, separate loop i pick that up after practice is over with and i wash them so um it's um it's really it, it does it's not a ton of work really at all it's uh it's pretty simple and the guys can handle it themselves for the most part they just give you the shorts back and i wash them and they got another pair for the next day That's awesome. That's awesome. Kate, you want to, um, you have any questions that you want to wrap up with? And yeah. Then we can... yeah, I think because we're in the last about 10, 12 minutes here, gonna, we're going to go ahead and open up to a few questions that came through the chat. Um, some of them you did already kind of address, but it looks like Dario has one. She wants to know a little bit more of the information about the technology behind it, in particular the output HD, how many muscles are involved, is it possible to export raw data, and if it's possible to sync the data to external load, like GPS or IMUs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the muscle groups, the technology is EMG, surface EMG, and so Logan uh, spoke to a little bit, um, usually, uh, whenever you're using a lab setting, you have gel to conduct a, a nice signal there. Um, sweat, so with our special sensors, sweat actually does a really good job of um, being the conductive material to enhance that signal for us. Um, so that's the technology. Kate, you might have to help me with other parts of the question. The muscle groups are hamstring, glute, and quads. So we're trying to get the big muscle bellies. Um, and then the last part was, oh, exporting data. Yes, you can export to CSV. Um, so we, that's how we build out a lot of stuff in Power BI. We use to, in our consulting um, 
sessions with Logan. Uh, we'll build out, build out a lot of that so it's really easy to maneuver through and answer questions and investigate, um, as well as our um, app also has the graphs and pretty easy investigation where you can see, um, okay, from a top view, this session they used 50% um, left leg, 50% right leg, 30% glute, you know, whatever the percentages are. And then you can also dive deeper and see just a second by second um, what you would imagine from an EMG curve. A, a little bit noisy, but we have it um, as a rolling, sec rolling 20 second average. So it, um, it just gives you a good idea of that player's neuromuscular signature, how much they're contributing from each uh, muscle group, left or right. And then um, being able to track that over a single session and then also longitudinally over, um, over multiple sessions. Um, and then the other question was external load, right? Uh, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning. Um, and I think that is something that we're um, looking at a lot as the, whenever we're using muscle load as a response metric, it's a response, a physiological response metric. Um, how can we compare that to, okay, you know, their physiological response might be high or low, similar to heart time spent in heart rate zone five, right? It might be high or low, but what does that actually mean whenever you don't have it in the context of how long did you practice today? It's the similar idea for um, external load in that, okay, we have how much you did from a movement standpoint that day, and now we can use that to put into context our uh, muscle load as a response variable and get an idea of efficiency of electrical activity there. Um, so that's, that's that first graph when Logan was talking about the periodization, we were able to see um, their, what they were doing externally, kind of actualizing Logan's periodization plan, and then um, how their bodies were responding was that other line. Awesome. And then we have another question. This one's directed at Logan. Has Strive helped you with bridging the gap between the training room and the weight room? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, so I think um, uh, as many eyes as you can have on the players, the better um, sort of thing. So I I'm obviously observing them in practice and, and in the weight room and their performance. Um, but then once I start to look at and, and, and look and have, you know, like I said earlier, tangible data and information of and paints a bigger and broader, better picture of, of what they're experiencing in practice and games and weights, um, and then I can actually bring that information to our athletic trainers and then they can do their own deep dive, you know, so like where, where my expertise isn't in, in athletic training, it isn't in, isn't in, you know, rehabilitation of injuries. Um, so that them being able to say, okay, and I've seen something like this before here, these are sign symptoms, you know, so on and so forth. And then they can act as well. So I, I do believe that it's 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 helped a ton um, as from a communication standpoint, and then just a collaborative measure of making sure that these guys are performing at their best. Yes, that's great. And then this one, I believe, for uh, Zach or Dean, how would the muscle load numbers compare to the internal load? Um, and I believe she means Trump variable from heart rate data or Trump variable from heart rate data. We actually just talked about this today. Mute. Logan, do you, I mean, do you want? Do you have anything you'd like to say, guys? There? Uh, not. I mean, no, not really. Like, I think, I think, I think both are. I think heart rate data is very valuable. I really do. Um, it's. I don't. I, I haven't used it a ton. Um, so I can't. Ex, you know, I don't have any expertise on, on that. Um, but like we were talking the other day, just uh, hitting different heart rate zones is different than is different than uh, muscle fatigue and 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 intermuscular usage. So um, not that it would trump one or the other, but I think, I think they're both very valuable. Um, it's just whichever one you prefer to utilize. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know, the, the question might've been trimp scores. I don't know, but anyways, I think it will probably all add up to the, uh, to the end goal of, so this, this idea of um, heart rate so far when it's being measured has been used for internal internal load like that's what they just kind of use it interchange the words interchangeably and i think that's um one thing that we at strive try to address head on right is um heart rate is a vital part of internal load but it's not 
everything that makes up internal load. Like there's other systems that contribute to um, your internal response, how your body is handling the external load. And so we have the cardiorespiratory system that people have used um, heart rate monitors to, to monitor, and that's, that's fantastic. But here we're trying to fill in that other side, this other part of internal load in the neuromuscular system and say, okay, we can actually monitor both of these um, things now. And I would, I would imagine that um, eventually we'll, you can progress and add up a lot of different parts. We're not, we're not claiming that we're finishing the picture of internal load either in that you have RPEs like psychological, that's part of it. Um, psychology is part of internal load. Um, bone stress is part of internal load, but here we are saying, um, whenever you talk to fatigued athletes, I think trying to separate the idea of I'm out of breath and I have dead legs. It's like, okay, these are two separate ideas and while they're intertwined, um, we need to measure them separately so we have a good idea of this, the current state of the athlete. Um, and a, a lot of times we like to use the the car, the car example of like, okay, um, here I have how many miles I've ran, but um, I need to know how my engine is doing. And so um, having a really, painting a really good picture of that, how your engine, how the internals are doing, I think is the next step of um, athlete monitoring and kind of as we develop with wearables, uh, where I believe that's the direction that wearables are headed currently. Paul Robbins spoke on this yesterday at the, um, the NFL strength conditioning coaches, you know, and, and spoke very well of, about it. I'm sure most everyone here knows who he is and talked about, you know, getting the, you know, the best data and what does it look like so you can complete the, you know, the picture and not just rely on um, one because it's the simplest one. You know, you've got to make sure that you've, you've um, you know, provided a common sense approach to understand, you know, what are all the you know, factors and then, um, you know, as to um, you know, the previous question is, what does it look like to make sure that they're all put in context to be able to understand like what is affecting this athlete? I, I yeah. uh, Logan, um, where, do, where do you think muscle measurement is going to get to? And you spoke at, um, where you were talking in the gym that you, you're so busy in the gym. Do you, do you see it that you'll get to the point where it, will you be your dream? for us to be able to have it so that the players can see it on their phone. If you prescribe them a program, yes. so you can see this stuff is actually doing what I prescribed. Is that like, is that like the moonshot? Yes. I, now I, I think so, sometimes you can, depending on the athlete, you could paralyze them with, with information uh, like that, or you can, you get um, some very cerebral athletes that want to overthink instead of just go out there and perform. Um, so you don't, you got to be careful with that. But I, I do think that if we could, if we could filter the types of information that they see from that we're, that we're receiving as a, from a practitioner standpoint, if we can filter the information we want the athletes to see and they can see it on a daily basis to their phones, I think they're going to be very uh, much more aware of, okay, this is how I feel. This is, this is what I feel. This is, uh, you know, I need to talk to coach O or I need to talk to um, our athletic trainer and find out like, okay, what can I do to improve this? Or is this even an issue? That sort of thing. So um, I do, and I voiced that uh, um, in, in the past, like it'd be really cool if the app itself could, could show, could show the athletes some, some metrics. Yeah. Yeah. It's good that you asked that question. It's certainly, you know, um, striving in that direction. Um, there's some pretty good success there right now. And you spoke about micro dosing. You spoke mm -hmm. about micro dosing, and that's cool. That's awesome. You say that because that's having confidence to know what you're actually prescribing. And so that again is another like really cool example of, of if you can measure it, then you have the confidence to micro dose. And you know, people can say, right here is our day for our big strength session or running or whatever it looks like. But you know, getting the context of exactly what you're doing means you've got the confidence to you know, uh, execute that so you can, you know, help the athletes reach their potential. And, you know, micro dosing of training is, is awesome. And it's, uh, I think there's a ton of, ton of um, opportunity there, you know, individually with athletes because they're more deeply engaged in the process of, of making themselves better. Right. Yeah. And I think um, this is the first year we've done micro dosing and it, from on my side of things, you know, with uh, um, I've always wanted to, 
do it. You know, I've, it's always been something that I've, I've been interested in. I've, I've read on and consulted with other people about, but with, uh, but with the help of strive and the information I'm getting from strive on a daily basis, like I know, I know what day is going to be our hard day of practice because it's, that's the trend. Like that's what we do. That's it's how it goes. So I know what day I can make my hard day in the weight room. I know what day I can, I can, I need to pull it back. I know what day I need to do speed. I know what day I need to do power. I know what day I need to do strength. I need to know what day I do strength, power, speed, strength, whatever speed, power, excuse me. Um, so like, that's a, you're exactly right. And then with all that information, we can, we can, you know, make a plan that's very, very individualized. So. That's great. Now, then it looks like there's one more question popped up from Marco. How difficult is it interpreting and understanding the data you receive? Uh, at first, it's a lot. Like it's, um, you, you, you're, it's just like anything that's new. Um, it's a lot. You're trying to navigate through um, each of the each of the windows within the within the system, trying to pull out what data you that is the most important to you, and 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 what's the most pertinent, and what's you know what am I actually looking at? I think how I how I started was, was like okay, I'm gonna look at these two data points, and it was right to left symmetry and efficiency. And so I'm just going to look at those. I'm going to keep tracking those. I'm going to monitor those for each individual guy, uh, as well as from a team standpoint. And I'm going to just keep like making sure I'm on top of that. And then, I mean, if I was talking to Zach probably once a week or once every other week, probably, and we were constantly going through data, looking at, um, <clears throat> looking at, um, different ratios between internal external load symmetries um, with uh, activation, the frequency, uh, looking at fatigue, we were looking at all kinds of things. And, and the more and more that I spent more and more time I spent with him, the easier it is for me to make and discern my own um, conclusions on my own. Um, so, and like I said, this is uh, the second year we've used it. And I, I feel like I got a pretty good handle on, on the information that I'm looking at. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we are coming up at our end right here. So I do want to just give you a huge shout out to Logan because he has been very instrumental and very helpful for us today. Um, just sharing the way you've used Strive with your programs there as well. Thank you for our, our sports scientist, Zach, for taking us through, um, you know, how you go through the data with Logan and other teams as well. And Dean Riddle for joining us in just this discussion to kind of take you guys through our, EM our EMG technology. You guys can, if you have any additional questions or, you know, want to schedule a demo with Strive itself, you can contact us here at sports at wherestrive.com, or you can reach out to our um, sports contact is, is Derek Wester at derek.wester at wherestrive.com, um, and he can definitely help you out, set you up with the demo so you can learn a little bit more um, about our technology and how we're taking, you know, the sports science to the next level out here. So thank you again. I will have a recording of this webinar as well and send it to everybody that was registered. So you will be able to kind of touch base and look back on it as, as well later, later in the week or down the road. All right, if there's anything else, you guys uh, feel free to reach out with questions, but I appreciate your time today.